everybody. Welcome. I'm Karen Yankovich and welcome to this week's episode of Get Seen, Be Heard. Um, the place to be if you want to learn how to use social media and PR profitably and stop being the world's best kept secret. Um, we have Susan Solovic with us here today and we're going to introduce her in a minute. But first, I want to just talk to Christina a little bit, find out what's happening in your world um, with PR this week. Anything interesting going on? Yeah, you know, I, I've been like anti-television this week, like all the bad news. So I haven't really watched like usually and I keep saying politics, politics. And Susan, we'll dive into this a lot more because you have a heavy journalism background before you did what you did. Um, I keep telling people find ways that you can affiliate your business with the election, whether it's doesn't matter whether you know which side you're on. But what is Donald Trump doing that has to do with your business that you can you know relate yourself as an expert? Um, you know, and that's just going to be the hot thing until the election in November. Um, I told Karen, I thought this might be a good time to share my story of um, building relationships in the media because I'm such a firm believer in that and that's how you get things done. And again, Susan, we'll talk about that too. But um, I serve as a board member on the marketing board at Virginia Tech, which is my alma mater. And that's where Hoda Kotke went to school. And I kept saying to them, why have we never done anything with Hoda? And they said, we can't get to her. And I said, well, can I try? And they said, sure. So what do I do? I go to the Today Show producer that I've built a relationship with. She knows I'm legitimate. She knows I'm not crazy. And uh, within 24 hours, we have her booked for an event. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. And it's so, I'm so excited. And we're live streaming it. And we've got 450 people live coming. And the best part of all is because I put this whole thing together, because of all these relationships, I get to interview her. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited. So build relationships with people. It really, really works. You know, this is it a does. relationship that I got this. So, and we'll talk a lot with you, Susan, about that too, because that's such an important part of becoming an expert in your industry. And you're a regular on TV and, you know, as a business expert. And I want to talk about how you've done that, but I'm sure a lot of it was building relationships with people. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Perfectly. Yes. Yeah. All right, so Karen, how about your world? Oh, can't hear you. They can't hear you, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I am gonna force her to buy herself a Mac for Christmas. <laughs> we can't hear you. <laughs> you can just tell by her facial expression. <laughs> so let's see, she's probably gonna log off. So what we'll do, let's see, she's She's going to log off. All right. So when this happens, Susan, we usually just dive okay. in. Okay. So why? <laughs> That's fine with me. Introduce yourself. Tell everybody about you. And, you know, we'll just start chit-chatting. We'll bring Karen on when she gets back. Fine. Well, um, actually, I'm the poster child for reinvention, I have to say, when it comes to my career. I started out, uh, Christine as you said in television news as a news anchor and reporter actually a little bit before that I was in sales I have to tell you I graduated with a double major in history and political science and like who wants to hire somebody with a degree I like was that a political so, science major <laughs> so there you go I yeah. <laughs> so I my first job was actually selling advertising specialties trinkets and trash you know straight commission and I remember I thought if I could just make a thousand dollars a month I would be so oh rich but anyway, but I got into television news. I did that for a while. I went into the corporate world, sort of the entrepreneurial bug bit me very quickly. I went out and started my own PR and advertising agency, learned a very important lesson here as a single woman, uh, built the business to over a million dollars in billings. And then my largest client, which made 90% of my client base, went bankrupt. And guess who went out of business? Oh <laughs> so never put all your eggs in one basket. You know, that's my great, it's, I call it my very expensive MBA. So I went back to the corporate world, uh, back into the marketing uh, arena. I became the first female executive in the division of a Fortune 100 company and became uh, executive vice president of international marketing for that company. Uh, at the same time, I went to Knight Law School, got my law degree, uh, graduated with honors, passed the bar, and when my company was sold, I decided to practice law for a while. I tell all of my lawyer friends, and I have many of them, and I respect what they do, that, you know, I practiced for 20 minutes. I got it right. I didn't have to do it anymore, right? So I, I loved law school. I hated the practice of law. Um, but I did see in my career as 
a corporate executive, as a female corporate executive, as an attorney dealing with a lot of divorce cases, child custody cases, um, employment discrimination, that there are inequities for women in the workplace and they continue. I don't, it, it, it's, I, as long as I've been working, it hasn't really improved all that much. And I felt as a communicator, I could do more to help women achieve and empower women by writing about it and talking about it than I could by just being in the trenches and doing it. So I started doing a company called Susan Says. It was called Susan Says because women have done what Simon says all these years. They need to do what Susan <laughs> says. And it was really focused on helping women understand how they self-sabotage their own careers and what we can do to step up to the plate. And Christina, just what you did with Hoda, you go out there and ask for it. What is the worst that's going to happen? I mean, I have to tell you, you know, we, we were talking about politics. I went up to the Donald the first time I met him and I put pointed my finger in his face and I said, you need to be doing business with me. Well, guess what? We had several different meet, meetings with oh, him. Love and it. Didn't do a deal. Yeah, didn't do a deal, but he did describe me as a woman with a lot of chutzpah. So, you know, you've got to ask for it. So I did that for a number of years and then the opportunity to start one of the first video internet based websites came along, which I launched in 2003 and everyone said, Susan, you're absolutely nuts. Video on the web will never ever work. Um, and I can, say, I can say the rest is history. Uh, I grew that business from its infancy, raised venture capital. Um, we were several million dollars when I exited and sold out at the end of 2009. And now I just love what I do. I get to help people start and grow businesses. And, and as, as your promo said, I get to ignite their business growth. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. That's awesome. All right, Karen, do you have all, do, can we hear you? I, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. I just okay. sure. So, do you see that tech block is making it snow on us? It's the only way we're going to see a white Christmas here in New Jersey. That's for sure. Oh, so that's like cute. Seven. That's on my it's website too, by the way. The snowflakes coming down. Yeah. It, it's supposed to be 85 in Virginia tomorrow. I said, "What do you wear on Christmas oh, wow. Eve?" I, know. I, I know. I'm in this, and it's hot outside. I know. I actually, it was 71 earlier today in St. Louis, but the temperature is plummeting. Oh. So that is no fun at yeah. all. I mean, it's going to be down like in the upper 30s tonight. So wow. I, I'm, I'm surely not complaining about 70 on Christmas, but it is a little crazy. It is a little crazy. So I'm happy to see yeah. you know. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. So um, Susan, I'm really excited to hear what you have to say because everything you say, you know, I'm a big champion of all of that. I, I you know, um, that's why Christina and I do this show because we really love to empower our customers and, and you know a lot of our customer bases we definitely have men in our customer base but a lot of them are women and a lot of times it's the women that need that extra boost of confidence that extra boost of support so and are not in you know on my side of it are not as comfortable kind of sharing their genius like telling us telling the world how good they are at what they do so so I like to kind of help people do that but what you missed, what we missed when I went dark, I, I, I promise you guys in 2016, I will get a Mac or something that will make this lab work better for me. Um, but in the meantime, I can't make that decision so fast, right? So I'll do it. But um, what I'm really excited about this week, and I definitely think it's going to help with that confidence issue for women is, you know, we talked about this a little bit last week, the live streaming on Facebook and just live streaming in general is a is going to be a, such a hot topic in 2016 and Facebook just last week is rolling out live Facebook live to all of their users, not just verified users. You know, I'm verified on my business page and I can stream on my business page, but now I can stream on my personal page and that changes the game because what that's doing. And I have to tell you something, even me who, you know, teaches confidence in, in business when I, when I stream on my business page, I'm streaming as Karen Yankovich, the business professional, which I'm very confident in. When I stream on my personal page, I get a little bit of that, well, wait, who's listening? And my high school friends and you know, and, and my family, and what are they all gonna think? So it is a little bit of a different mindset, but I think that I think that it's a game changer for business because it allows people to get to know you so quickly. You know, regardless of whether or not you have a platform like this or like you have with your book. So I'm really excited about it. I just streamed before this broadcast and kind of invited the people that were watching on Facebook over here. So I don't know if they'll join us or not, but um, I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to use it. I just got access yesterday. So it's pretty exciting. It's pretty, it's pretty big stuff, I think. 
I have to tell you, very cool <laughs> about that. I have a former client. I don't know if you guys remember the song Crush in the 90s. And I'm not singing yeah. for you, but um, Jennifer Kate. <laughs> and she's making a big comeback. She just did a Kickstarter um, to, for her next album. And she just got fully funded. And she went on Facebook Live a couple hours ago kind of to thank everybody. And uh, it was pretty cool. Yeah. It is pretty cool. Yeah. It's a great way to build rapport with everyone, right? So I and I think that sense that you can actually feel like you're with that person rather than just words. You know, we all know in emails we've sent a joke out that we thought was funny and someone else didn't think it was so funny because they misinterpreted the way the words were written. It's it's not as hard it's not as easy to do that when you can actually see someone's body language and facial expressions. But Karen, to your point, I do think, you know, it is overcoming that hurdle. But, you know, I be also believe this, and I personally, I mean, I have a problem with it too. I mean, I love Periscope, but, you know, I'm not, I've seen my friends out in the middle of the airport doing a Periscope deal, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking, oh gosh, I don't know. I don't want anybody looking at me. You know, I'll do it in the privacy of my own home, but not so much in the middle of the airport. But I do think that, and I, and I'm a lot older than you guys, so here's what I would say in my old age wisdom is, if people don't like me, you know what? It's their loss. If they have a problem with me, it's their loss. You know, it's really their issues. And it takes a really long time, I think, particularly for women because we take things so personally. But I always coach women and I say, you have to turn down the volume. You have to block out the background noise. If you can't block out the background noise, you can't hear yourself think and you can't build your greatness. So if you turn down the volume, focus on your own success, let them just chatter away because you know what? They don't have anything else going on in their lives. So they'd rather just sit there on their couch and badmouth you or make fun of you because they can't do it themselves. And that's their issue, not yours. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. And that's actually kind of where, where I put my head this morning when I decided I wanted to do another Facebook Live broadcast. I thought, you know, if people don't want to hear what I have to say and if they just roll past it, you know, like stop overthinking it that, you know, and, and yeah. you know, it's I try because it's because I do social media. Right. So I try. I'm still trying to decide what the balance on my personal pages between business and, per, and personal. Right. So I don't want it to be all business, but um, I think that I think that it, what it will do it was it will allow the people that I'm personally connected to a better insight into what it is that I do, which is pretty cool. And at the end of the day, <laughs> it is what I do, right? So it's my personal page, but, but what I do for a living is such a big part of me, the person. So it's okay to talk right. about it. Even I'm not selling and pushing; I'm just talking about it. Right? So. Uh, so Karen, let me tell you this. Uh, you know, I said I start out in the news business, and you know, on my personal page, I have a business page, I have a personal page, and I also have a Facebook group called Outrageous Success, which is really to to do what we were just talking about before, tout your greatness. I want people to come on and share their accomplishments without a feeling of being embarrassed about it, so we can all applaud each other because I feel a success for one person is a success for all of us. So I, I started that group, but I have on my personal page almost five thousand of my closest friends, right? So I'm really protective about what I put on there. I mean, you rarely will see me talk about my family members or anything like that. But when I was in the news business, my news director counseled me with this. He said, Susan, when you're on the air, it's 80% about the story and 20% about you. People do want to know you. They want to sense your personality. I'm a dog lover, a huge dog lover. So, you know, you will we'll see pictures of my dogs and you will talk, hear me talk about my little angels on Facebook. Um, but you may not hear me talk about my cousins, my little cousins or my nieces and my nephews. So, um, but that gives them a sense a little bit that I am a human being. I'm not a machine, not just focused on business, that I am a real person, that I have a heart. Here's who I am. But I keep it at that 80%, 20% kind of rule. I like that. And we talk about this kind of every week because I my Facebook is strictly friends, strictly personal. And people, when business people connect, I mean, unless we've gotten to be friends, but right. I don't have to worry if I go on vacation that my house will get robbed unless it's robbed by somebody I'm close oh. with. But, but am right. I missing the boat by not letting anybody in and all these potential you know clients or customers I don't know it's a it's a slippery slope 
Well, a little word of caution about that, putting you know on your vacation yeah. pictures and things like that. Um, a true story, a number of years ago, I actually had a Facebook stalker who then started showing up at events where I was oh. and became very persistent that we actually had to get the FBI involved. So I was told, do not ever say, particularly as a woman traveling by myself, don't say where you are at any specific time or place unless you know you're going to be surrounded by a big group of people. And do not ever put out that you're on vacation. If you want to post those vacation pictures when you come back, hey, you know, we were just in uh, Jupiter, Florida, and man, did we have a great time. Look at these photos. You know, um, that's fine. But you are asking for trouble if... Um, particularly as women, if you're posting that, that's why I won't do a check-in. I don't want people to know where I am. That's my thing, but yeah. I think it's a safety issue for women. Yeah, and that's why I don't have a lot with my Facebook. I do keep it limited to very close, but yeah, I, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's, let's pick your brain a little bit since you were a journalist. Of course, that's my passion, helping people, you know, get exposure. You know, how... From that side of it, you know, how, what do you like to see? Like, we always encourage people, you know, go on social media, connect with journalists, build a relationship, don't pitch right away, you know, share their work, it, you know, get, get, to, get to know them online, get them, let them to start seeing you on a regular basis. And then when you pitch, you're, you know, you're kind of a warm foot in the door. Well, and Twitter's a great resource for that because you can follow reporters who are covering your industry or your topic of it or your area of expertise, and you can engage them and talk to them. I personally do that with brands. So for give you for to give you an example, of course this store is now out of business, but do you remember Cache, oh, the yeah. clothing store for women? Oh God, it was one of my favorites. And I started following them and tweeting pictures of me on TV or giving a speech in another great cache dress. Well, I started getting free dresses from Cache. But then they went out of business, so I don't know. Maybe it was my fault. But <laughs> anyway, so, um, but I think that's one good way. But I also think that people really need to understand the difference between um, pitching a reporter, getting on the air, getting to be participatory in a program or a segment. Um, they need to understand that there's a difference between pitching their product. They may think they have the best rags to riches story that ever, you know, happened in the entire world, which, you know, we all have those stories, right? They're a dime a dozen. Or I get a lot of um, pitches from people that say, you know, I'm an expert in social media and I can talk about this, 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 and this. Well, you know what? That does me no good because I might be working on a story right there about expense management. So guess what? That pitch just goes in the trash. I'm not interested in you now. You haven't given me a story idea. So what I always tell people, in the, and having come from a journalism background, is I look at the headlines of the news, and I think, what's going on now? So you were just talking about politics. So if I were going to pitch myself right now when it comes to politics, I'm going to talk about what do small business owners want to hear from those presidential candidates? Who's saying things that resonate with them? Who's saying things that irritate them? Um, and what do we need? If we could mesh them all together, maybe, what would that look like? How could we come out with the best candidate to support small business? What are the issues impacting small business right now? So we know tax reform is huge. We know the um, overtime uh, proposed new overtime laws is a huge issue. We know that the minimum wage is a huge issue. And of course, health care continues, but access to capital. Um, you know, the SEC just passed um, regulations for crowdfunding now that allows um, non-accredited investors to invest actually as an equity investor in small businesses. I think that's going to open up a new, a new whole area of cash flow um, and investment opportunities for small business. So that's a good thing. So those are the kinds of things that I would try to tie into the headlines right now. And even when we're talking about issues of terrorism, let's talk about risk t uh, management in your business. So acts of terror, as we have seen, can happen anywhere. And so what happens if something goes, happens in, right in your own neighborhood, in your community, near your store, or God forbid, in your, in your office building or in your storefront? How do you manage that situation? How do you notify other uh, employees? And how do you get your business back up and running? How do you have a communication tree so that you know what employees are safe or where are they? What's going on? Those are all the things that you need to think about in advance because according to the statistics, if disaster happens, whether man-made or natural disaster, if your business isn't back 
somewhat in its mode within 72 hours, the chances of you getting back on your feet successfully are slim and none. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Sorry to be a downer, but it's the, but I wanted people to understand the importance of planning, you know, to have a disaster preparedness plan. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's that's great advice, Susan. It really is. That's really good advice. A lot of those things I don't even think about. You know, I mean, I watch the elections and I think about it from a social media standpoint. But the reality is social media and the and politics and small business really, you know, there's a miss there. Maybe there's a missing piece of some of the things I'm talking about. So I right. love that. Well, I think. I think there's a lot of rhetoric on both sides of the aisle, in both parties. There's a lot of rhetoric about small business. You know, small business is a backbone of the economy and we want to help small businesses. The problem is most people who are in that level of government, uh, whether they're an agency, uh, uh, you know, a long lifetime public uh, servant or they're elected politician, they really have not ever worked at that level, in a small business entrepreneurial level in our economy. So therefore, they make these rules and these propose this legislation that makes sense on a macro level to them, but they don't understand the under, understand it and under, um, unintended consequences that are gonna really impact a small business. So that's why you see, if you look at compliance with the EPA, for example, which has been in the news a lot lately, it cost a small business 369% more than it does a large business just to comply with EPA regulations. The regulatory burden on small businesses is humongous and we're living in a hyper regulatory era right now. So small businesses are need some relief. And we're also seeing for the very first time since the Census Bureau has been tracking the number of startups and business closures, 30 years, for the very first time, startups have always outpaced closures. But this year, for the first time, that line crossed. And not just by a little, we're talking 100,000 more closures than wow. small business startups. And wow. this is the segment of the economy that is supposed to be creating jobs, is supposed to be the innovators, the creators, more patents and trademarks come out of small businesses. What's going to happen to our economy if we don't get small business back on track? And is that is that mainly due to regulatory issues? It's, it's, it's a hodgepodge of things. It's a myriad of things. It is taxes, the complication of the tax code. Um, obviously, regulation is key. As I mentioned earlier, access to capital. And if we want to talk just about women business owners, women business owners get less than 3% of all venture capital out there. So, and what is the really the fuel that helps startups grow to scalable, sustainable, large enterprises, it's venture capital for the most part. So, you know, that's that's certainly holding people back. Um, employees, you know, of those small businesses who want to hire right now, they can't find qualified applicants, even though the job participation rate in the U.S. is the lowest it's been in 30 years. So, you know, there are people out there that aren't even counted among the unemployed that just simply aren't working. But I think one of the problems is small businesses can't afford to pay fair market value necessarily for the talent that they need to grow their business. So for example, in my own company, when I hired people and I hired some great technology experts um, and you know, we could not begin to pay them the hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year they were going to get in a, in, a, in a larger company. What we could give them was equity for their participation in the company. So now they have a vested interest. And that's the other issue with the overtime regulations. If you raise the threshold of overtime to $50,000 a year, you are going to be limiting small businesses' abilities to create these unique compensation packages to get the talent that they need to grow their enterprises. Ooh, I didn't think, I've never even thought of that either, Susan. That's really that's good. No, that's really good. And I have these. Do I sound like I'm running for office or something? Oh no, but you sound very passionate about it. Wow. And, and it's, it's, yeah. And, and I know my husband and I are both small business owners. And I hate this time of year because when our accountant starts looking at everything, you have two business owners. It, it kills you in taxes. Kills you. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. And it it's just different for small, you know, two small business owners. So it's very, I, I really relate to everything you're saying. 
Well, you know, last week the House just passed the permanent expensing bill um, to allow, hopefully, that um, the expensive level for small businesses in one year would be half a million dollars. Um, if, they, if it doesn't pass the Senate and it isn't signed by the president, it'll revert to only $25,000 again. So not that most small businesses are going to spend half a million dollars in one year, but the ability to be able to expense that off your tax bill as opposed to having to amortize it over a certain number of years is a huge benefit and certainly is going to um, encourage small businesses to invest in their companies. What are the odds of that passing? We think it's pretty good, actually. It looks pretty, yeah, um, you know, there's never any guarantee, you know, I can get a, excuse this, pissing contest about something else, and then that's going to fall through the cracks, but. Um, Whatever that yeah, last line is in the bill that some, some little right. senator from somewhere wants to try to push through. That's exactly right, absolutely. Awesome. Interesting. Interesting. So. So how do you get in? Tell us a little bit about how you get involved. Like, where do you share this content? I mean, I know you have your books. I know you have the, the you know, the website that you're involved in. But tell us a little bit about where, you know, how do you, when you get involved in these conversations, how do you, where does your message come out? Where can we see that and read that? And Well, one of my biggest um, initiatives now is with the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council, which is SB is the boy, e, council.org. And um, so we're constantly, in fact, they have a great economist there who, I his name's Ray Keating, and I love the way Ray takes the numbers that we see in the headlines and breaks them down to the reality as far as how this affects small businesses and what's not being said. So the, the fine print, if you will. Um, also, you know, SBE Council, we keep you updated on what's happening on Capitol Hill, what do you need to know about, and, and it's all bipartisan, by the way, and it's a nonprofit organization, so it's not like we're saying we're not espousing the Republican viewpoint, we're not espousing the Democratic viewpoint, we are espousing what's best for small business. So that's one place. I also blog on my website almost daily, so that's SusanSolovic.com. And then I have a new initiative too, uh, which I'm really excited about. It's called the Small Business Expert Ac uh, Academy. It's uh, just www.smallbiz with a Z, expertacademy.com. It's a membership website, but my goal there is not only to provide great content to help small businesses grow, the real fundamentals, the building blocks that they need in order to build successful and scalable enterprises instead of just being that hamster on the wheel and running around and running around and getting nowhere. Um, but it's also about really being a virtual mentor to them. So it's 24 seven and uh, I, I, I'm not a coach. I don't coach people one on one necessarily. I do you know, occasionally, but uh, for the most part, I want to be there to help as many small businesses grow to multi-million dollar uh, organizations as I can. The alarming thing is the average small business, let's say a sole proprietorship, works 52 hours a week and grosses $44,000 a year. Now, you know, if you're going to if you're going to work that hard and now you know, let's take the taxes out of that and let's take everything else out, right? So, um, yeah, I want I want small business owners to understand you are putting your talent, your expertise, your personal resources, you're making self-sacrifices from your families. Um, you know, I bet there are many of us who are going to be working on Christmas Day because that's what we have to do. And so, um, and nobody's paying us time and a half, by the way. <laughs> and so, um, I think that if you're going to work that hard, you deserve to get the financial rewards for that kind of effort. And my goal is to really teach entrepreneurs how to do that. And I'm working on a new book called The 1% Edge. And The 1% Edge are those minor adjustments that you can make in all aspects of your business, from your mental mindset to your product and service to your internal process and systems in order to really cut through the competition clutter and soar to success. And I'm talking multi-million dollar success. And that's what I'd love to see. I'd love to see millions and millions of small businesses making millions every year. Oh, no. Wouldn't that be great? Would. Yes, it would. You know, it? Susan, when I was when I was doing a little homework um, before I knew I was going to meet you today, because Susan was a guest of Christina's, I we had not met before. Um, I heard you talking about that the organization, and that that that's like trigger word for me, I think, which I didn't really realize it, and I kind of thought, well, I have to really, you know, I have an organization, I have multiple people that support my business, and I, you know, I'm lucky to have amazing people, but when I think of it as an organization, it a little bit of a trigger word for me so I think that that's I think that what you're providing to small business owners like me 
you know, there's lots of people like Christina and I that are providing sales support and, and marketing support. And how do you get clients and how do you make money? But how do you keep money and how do you run your business? It's, there's not as much of that. Right. And that, I think, is what I really was interested about when I was reading about you and your your stuff was that I really have to think more like a business owner if I'm going right. to continue to be successful in my business. Right. You know, so I love that message. Every, every business really has the capability to become scalable. And when your business is scalable, it means that you can extract yourself from the business for six months and come back and it's going to be even better than it was when you left. So you cannot be the product or the service, you know? Um, and, and, you know, that's my personal definition of it. And maybe that's a little bit extreme, but I'm trying to paint a picture of what that would be like and feel like. Um, you need to rise above it and and so in order to be scalable you look at your business model and you think about what I what you do how you do it and how you deliver it and then the three key words are it must be teachable repeatable and consistently delivered so scalability is based on a teachable product or service that can be repeated easily and that will always provide consistent results for your customers and clients it's like the magic formula. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm going to open up this seat. If anybody wants to jump into this conversation and ask Susan some questions directly, we'd love to have you. Um, you know, I, I know some of you in here, so I'm not going to call you out, but I'd love for you to jump in. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, come on, embarrass them, Karen. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. Frank's, coming. Frank's joining us. Say, so take hey, advantage. Good morning, ladies. Or good afternoon. How are you? Hey, welcome. Hi, Frank. Hi, how are you? I love what you're saying, Susan. It resonates uh, deeply with me. I'm a, I'm a startup coach, consultant, mentor, and I'm a multiple entrepreneur. Um, actually, we just did a, uh, a startup conference last week here on Blab and um, went very, very well. Would love to maybe have you um, participate next year when we do our Startup Con Live 2016. Sure, absolutely. So I wanted to sort of put that out there and re reach out to you. And I am someone who's, you know, so today is a very big day for me. Today's a very exciting day. Um, I just rang the opening bell for NASDAQ. Oh, with my yeah. oh cool. Congratulations. That's Thank amazing. you. Thank you very much. Very exciting. If you look at my Twitter profile uh, or Facebook, I just posted some pictures about it. It's got a, I've got a picture of me standing at the podium. Um, on the outside of the NASDAQ building. Oh, very, very that's nice. great. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. But it, it's not been an easy, thank you. It's not been an easy journey. Oh, <laughs> so it's, uh, if it were easy, everybody would be doing it. I was just going to say it? that. Yeah. Yeah. Entrepreneurs, business owners, I mean, we're a unique group. And right, it's, it's hard. I speak about and, it a lot. It's Let's not sugarcoat it. I mean, I love no, what I do. No. Yeah. And I would work 24-7 if I could, but it's not easy. I know. It's what was not easy. saying? Take not six easy. months off. I'm thinking I'd like to try and take Christmas off. I know. I was on vacation in Mexico, and I think I worked about four or five hours every yeah. day at least. Yeah. yeah. My choice for the most part for me, but still, if I had to disappear for a week, it would be a problem. So. Yeah, and that, that's a challenge. And I, I love what you're saying that yes, you need to get to the point where you can make it you know, scalable. And, and I also quoted sustainable, okay, long term, so that you can't take right. off six months is a reach unless you've, you know, arrived and, and you've got everything on autopilot, depending on what type of a business that you're in. Okay. I know that, um, you know, there's no way we could have taken, you know, I could have taken six months off when we were building that company. We were lucky to yeah, get, no, no, in the beginning, we were lucky to get Sundays off. You know? yeah. <laughs> right, right. No, that's a, that's a, it's a long term goal. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But um, it, it, it takes a team. You've got to have a team, and that team is going to be what's eventually going to support you in creating you know, that, that window for you to be able to take time off. You've got to know that the people right. on your team have got your back, okay, that they can keep right. things going. And that's, that's where you have to look for hiring the right people, making sure they're in the right seats, and that they Absolutely. all share your vision. Yeah, I'm a huge yeah. job. and I think that, yeah. And one of the mistakes that a lot of startups make is they get their backs up against the wall, they're overwhelmed, and they just think any warm body's better than nothing. 
you know, and you really have to invest in the right talent. And one of the things I tell small businesses is on that very first critical first hire, before you even think about that, you should think about what your job description should be. So what is it that you do best for your company to grow it? And, you know, and then look at what other things need to be done. And then those are the skills and uh, the experiences that you want to hire for because that gets it off your plate. So for example, me, I know that one of my weaknesses is um, managing the financial aspects of my business. I can do it, but I don't like it and I'm not really that great at it. So first person I bring in is somebody who loves numbers, <laughs> who loves that detail and operation. And that's a good compliment to me. It's not my best friend. It's not my cousin, Sally. Exactly. You know, it is somebody who brings something to the table. And, and I'll say this, I'm a numbers guy, but I am not like a design yeah. guy. And you know, PR has always been frustrating for me because when I've gone out to try and get PR for the company or, or, or what have you, it's, you know, I don't understand the process. I don't have the network and the connection. So it's, it's better for me those. to bring in an outsider expert or an inside expert who can, you know, have those kind of contacts. Right. So I'm not reinventing the wheel all the time. Right. Exactly. But finance, I can do spreadsheets in my sleep. <laughs> Good for you. I have nightmares about them. <laughs> I tell you guys, I don't want to do them. I can do them. Ladies, I'll be back. Right. I gotta yeah. go uh, check on my son. He's not feeling well. I'll be right back. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll tell you a funny yeah. story about that. I used to own a brick and mortar store for about ten years, and when we first opened the store, we had to go to you know gift show to go buy stuff for the store. So we had hired this wonderful woman who we just fell in love with, and then we hired a high school girl who was going to come in after school. And and Barbara and I got on a plane and we flew to Atlanta and we looked at each other like, oh my God, we just left this person we don't know in our store, you know, with all of our things and all of our money and everything we had for yeah. four days. <laughs> I hope. And you could, but it did. It was fun. We made a very good, good, good. hire. That's good. So does anybody want to jump in? Susie, Tracy. Oh, oh there's Susie. Susie. Yay. Okay. Oh, where is your camera? Hi. There we are. There you Hi. are. Hi. Hey, ladies. I just want to tell you that um, the favorite check that I write each month is to, or actually it's each quarter, is to my bookkeeper. Yeah. I throw <laughs> it down with, just because I can doesn't mean I should. And I can't. Yeah. I don't like it. It takes up time. I'd rather, like, my eyes glaze over, and there's a million other things that would, um, you know, my, my time is better spent doing. So I appreciate that and the uh, words of bring people in that can take the stuff off your plate that maybe you're not as good at or you don't enjoy doing. Well, you know, there's an old, there's an old saying that says, uh, nothing happens till you sell something. So if you're not out there selling, you don't need that that's bookkeeper, right? right? <laughs> exactly. Hell yes. Yes. That's that, that was yes. my 2015, I hired an assistant and a bookkeeper and it was the best and it was scary because I had to pay them, Yeah. you know, it was, but, but it left me open to get customers and I, I doubled my income this year. And I really think that's a lot great. Of that Congratulations. had to do with finally letting go and letting people help. Yeah. Or I was not right. strong. So yeah, that's, I definitely recommend that. I, you know, I was given good advice at the begin, beginning of 15 that to sort of look at your revenue streams and follow the money and like, why aren't you, why are you sort of fighting it and lean into where it is you're doing well. Yes. And if you double that money or income, it allow you to do maybe the passion projects or other things that you want to do. And stop, you know, saying right. I want to do it over here. You still have to make that money first in order to, you know, get it all done. Susie, that's a great point. I, I taught a women's entrepreneurial course uh, many years ago. And the first day of the class, I would ask the women in the room, like, you know, why do you want to go into business for yourself? And I'd hear, I want more balance. I want more control of the product. I want to, you know, change, you know, solve world hunger. I mean, I, you know, I don't know why at all. And 99% of the time, not one single woman in that room would say, I want to make money. And so I would like, I would mark through all those words and I would write the big word money on the chalkboard. And I would say, if you're not in business to make money, go volunteer. <laughs> you know? You've got it. The money's got to come money. first. Like silos of money, different revenue streams, yeah. wanting to come in. I don't know that it'll happen, but like that allows you to have the freedom to do your other stuff. Right. Exactly. It does. Right. Right. And, you know, especially as entrepreneurs and, you know, this is this is where this is part of some of the stuff that I had to learn and that I, I find a lot of people still have to learn is that 
people like that six i want that six figure business if my business is making six figures i'm not making six figures so I, That's could right. work in, I could work in a lot of places and make six figures and work less hours than i make in my business my business has to make two hundred thousand two hundred and fifty thousand maybe more for me to earn six figures so well, and one of, I, I wrote a book. I wrote a book called "The Girl's Guide to Building a Million Dollar Business." Um, I wrote it in 2006 because I I built a company that was more than a million dollars in revenue. And one of the things that I found was when you talk to women about building a million dollar business, they think, "Oh, I don't want to make that much money, or I don't want that much stress." And just to your point, Karen, even if you're making a million dollars in revenue or two million dollars in revenue, you're not taking that money home. And a lot of that is going right back into the investment and the growth of your company. But the good point is you can hire that talent that you need to help you grow your business. You can hire the outside resources. You do have a budget for marketing. And the other thing is you can begin to pay yourself a fair market salary, which is critical. When someone tells me their business is profitable, the first thing I ask them is how much you're paying <laughs> yourself. And then they look at me like, oh, well, uh, and I'm like, if you're not paying yourself what you would make on the open market, you're not profitable. Right. Right. That's such good advice. To, to, to that point, obviously it takes time to build a business. You're not going to start day one and have a million right. dollars in revenue. Oh, no, but no, what no. is what is the goal for you to have a successful business where you are paying yourself fair market value? Well, you know, the general uh, rule of thumb is the first year you lose money, the second year you break money and uh, break even hopefully, and the third year you start making money. So I'd said third year and beyond. Of course, it depends on your industry. Right. It's going to depend on, you know, if you're in a service business versus a product business. Obviously, a product business can grow a little faster. Um, so, I, you know, there are a lot of variables there, but I think after the third year, if you're not at least starting to be able to pay yourself something that is close to being reasonable, then you should start looking at your business model. Great. That's good. That's great. Yeah, that's great. And you know, there's that saying that, you know, listen, I love to achieve my goals. Like if I set a number, I want to reach that number. That being said, there's that, that saying that says if you shoot for the moon and you land in the stars, you know, that's still pretty good. Right. Exactly. So, that's what my mom always used to say to me. Right. Yeah, I do. And I always have people say, wow, you think so big. I'm like, yeah, because I think here and if I land here, I'm still so much further ahead than anybody else. I'm in good shape. I don't know if you all remember Michael Gerber, but he was like the first expert in this entrepreneurial space. He wrote the E-Myth oh, yeah. Theory. And one of his things is most the reason most small businesses fail is not because they're reaching too far or thinking too big. It's because they're thinking mm. too small. So that's I, I, I listen to that. I think about that all the time. Wow. Yeah, great point. Silos, silos of cash. Yes. <laughs> Different revenue streams. <laughs> people are like, you're out of your mind. And maybe I am, but it feels no. healthier that way. Like I love it. I love it. Can I show you guys, since Susie's here, I'm going to show you guys one of Susie's silos. <laughs> just this week developed this deck. It's called, uh, what's it called? Feel the Love? The Feel the Love deck? Oh, cool. Yes. Nice. They, they're hot off the press. I am so excited to have my own very... I've been giving them to all of my friends and they love them. And uh, yeah. so this is one of Susie's silos. You guys should. Uh, That's great. I'll check I, that out. I am in a service-based business and this is a product. So it's, it's, it's a different mindset and uh, it's there, there's been some nice success around it. And my uh, sort of hopes with it are huge. <laughs> Good. That's great. Oh, and you know, one of the things I think, I'm, I'm going to follow your one success. One of the things I say about this Susie that I think makes it stand out is Susie is an event planner. That's her cash cow, right? That's where the cash comes in to do right. this stuff. And the reason she's such a good event planner is because even when she designed a deck like this, so I don't know if you guys have are familiar with decks, but Susie created it so that there's a window in it. So your card of the day goes right in the window, which is a nice little touch that only an event planner would think of, but also that it's simple. Like on a, it sits. So once you pick your card, you can sit it somewhere and you can see it. So these are little touches that Susie went out of the way to create when she created this deck and is what makes her stand out from other people. And I love that you you thought differently. You were like, I'm going to do this my way, not the way. Thank you. I, so so I had to just share that. I bring it to the events, but there's also, it's, it's much more mainstream than that. So uh, we will see. And, and, we, and I kind of like that it's low tech, no tech. 
in, in very high tech world and in everything else that I do. So, you know. Susie, where do you get those? How can we find out about them? So there, you know, I do have a shop on my Greater Than We site, but I, I'm really, all the e-commerce is going through Shopify. So it's real dash the dash love. I can type it in the thing. Yeah, type um, it in. Yep. At my Shopify, I'll do that. Uh, thank you for that. That's nice. No, it's, I think it's amazing. And I, and I love that you thought big enough to do it, right? So I know so many people talking about doing a product like that. You know, how do you do it? But you said, I can, other people can do it. I can do it. Absolutely. And, and the truth is I had to make the money from the events sort of the first half of the year to be able to finance it. Because I really didn't want to go into personal savings to do it. And so um, one thing led to the other, which is sort of what I said in the beginning, follow the money. Cool. Thank you, ladies. I'm going to let you go and let the seat open up for somebody else, okay? Nice, nice to meet you, Susie. Susie. Good luck. Love. <laughs> Susie and uh, Christina and I, I'm going to put a link in this. If you guys can check this out later. We're involved in a project um, called Portraits and Profits, and uh, we haven't actually done anything. This We don't have anything on the books right now, but we should. So you can check that out when you have time, too, portraitsandprofits.com. Uh, Hi, ladies. Oh, Hi. Hi there. Another Christina. <laughs> Hello. Welcome. Hi, guys. So I'm um, based in the UK, as you can probably tell from the accent. And <laughs> Never would have guessed. I thought you were a yeah. girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have actually picked up a few bad, um, none of the good bits of uh, uh, the kind of southern uh, lifestyle, more the, the bad. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, mint juleps. They're, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. So I uh, run uh, e-commerce businesses, and I've also got a, a digital marketing agency. And 2016 is a little bit of a, a kind of coming a little bit of from behind the screen and doing more as me rather than sort of behind my business brands. And, and also at the moment, I'm really comfortable in my existing niches, and I've got great relationships in sort of industry-specific um, press, but when you were saying about thinking big, I'm thinking really big. <laughs> so, I love, love your advice on pitching to, um, I heard your piece uh, where you were talking about kind of tying into the presidential um, elections and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, first of all, I'll ask you two questions really. A, should I just say this is not my area of expertise and hire in a PR firm, or are you better to pitch directly yourself? Um, and do you think there's a bit of a difference between pitching European press and American press? Well, well, I, I'm going to yeah, go, go ahead. ahead and then I'll jump in. <laughs> you're All right, your I, day I, I, and I'll give my two cents. So I don't know um, enough about the European press to be helpful here. So I don't want to comment on that. Maybe one of the other ladies can. But um, I would say that you know, before you hire someone, you should really know what your voice is, what message you want to get out there. What is your voice? Who are you? Um, I think just jumping right in without really understanding what it is you want to achieve and accomplish. You know, for example, I'm known as the small business expert. So it took me a while to get to that like little tagline. And I see a lot of people sometimes that pitch to journalists and, well, I can talk about this, or I can talk about that, or I can talk about this. And that's really confusing. So in my opinion, you need to pick a lane and stay in it and become known as that expert. So, you know, sometimes you can start small at a local cable TV or a local newspaper and kind of cut your teeth and then go to the next step, hire a firm who can really help get you some bigger access. Okay. And I'm a huge proponent. I've never hired anybody. And I've been on national television and in national publications and local television. I was just on local Fox a, well, a couple weeks ago. Um, I think it can be done on your own. Um, most small business owners can't afford $3,000, $5,000, $10,000 a month for six months at a time. So again, it's that scalability, as Susan was talking about, when you have that million dollar business, okay, then you might be able to invest that kind of money and take that off your plate or your assistant's plate. But if you're on a smaller scale and you really need that exposure, like I did with my product-based business, you can do it and you can have success with it. It's learning the tools, building the relationships, doing a newsworthy pitch, like Susan said, you know, what 
what makes you, you know, I always say there are a million business coaches out there. What's that one thing you do that's unique, that, that makes you special? And I have a client that I worked with um, a couple of years ago who she was a business coach, but just one of her programs she did with her horses on her farm and brought business leaders out. And it was, you know, this whole leadership thing. And we got her front page on her local paper and we got her on Fox. And again, so like you were saying, Susan, find that that yeah. path, that lane was the one thing that makes you stand out from everybody else in your industry and go with that. Do you think they have help a reporter in, in the UK or Europe? Um, they have help a reporter they have, they have something similar in Ireland and there is and okay. my brain Karen, I talked about it when we did the Harrow workshop. No, my I just signed up for it yesterday and I don't and I think there, there, there is an okay. European one as well. Um, there's one for Australia. But Christina, reach out to me and I can well, point you in some direction. I actually was turning around to try and find a copy of it. Christina wrote the book on DIY PR. So <laughs> she actually, oh. if you go to Amazon yeah. and search her name, her she wrote a book on how to do your own PR. So for the cost of her book, 20 bucks, whatever it is, you know, you'll get a lot. Oh, it's 14 A whole bunch of great <laughs> tips on how to do your own PR. That doesn't mean you don't eventually hire someone, but you know, there's lots you can do on your own. Yeah, and I feel that um, I've, I've done a, a mix this year because in the e-commerce businesses, uh, partly because there's just been um, a lack of time internally with the team, um, I brought in a PR agency um, and, and the results have been, have been fine. But I've actually really missed the sort of personal contact with the editors and, and things like that. And, and yes, it's, but it's, it's that whole dilemma for um, kind of... Uh, on um, you know, kind of a couple of guest spots earlier. That whole you know, all the demands on your day. Um, you know, where do you where do you jump in? But uh, but I, I like. And what, one of the best things I did was hiring this assistant who I do all my pitching, but she does all the follow up. Yeah, I found somebody who's great on the phone who represents me very well, and that took all of that because that's the keys in the follow up. It's that getting them on the phone. They might get five hundred emails. They might get it, love it, flag it, forget mm -hmm. about you. I mean, Susan, you can probably really speak to that, but I can't tell you how many producers have said, oh, I saw that, that was great, I, I forgot, or, you know, I meant to yeah. email you back and I didn't. So that that might be worth an investment of you put together the pitches, and now my assistant is even comfortable enough if I say send this kind of a pitch, you know, to this address, she can go into my email and actually personally send it from me. Awesome. Okay. And so you definitely sort of are not struck because I always feel that in some ways you're interrupting. You think, oh, journalists are such busy people. I think it's probably a British thing. We're a little bit polite. I think it's, as long as it's relevant and timely, and it's not, as I said earlier, it's not just a pitch about uh, here's the great product I do and here's what it's going to do to change the world or whatever. Um, it really is good information for that particular producer or show or writer for their audience that's going to be helpful they've got a lot of you know they're, they're out there scrambling for stories unless there's a huge breaking news story for the most part and so they appreciate it but it does have to you do have to sort of spoon feed it to them you know here's here's the hook here's the news angle here are the points i would make and here's about the, the why i'm the best person to talk about it okay well, that's, that's you, yeah. you should check out my YouTube channel. There are a lot of clips on there with ideas on what Susan just said. I have a little formula that I use and I teach, and it's on there for free. You can see, you know, I I use a triangle that's, you know, be newsworthy, have a great hook, find the right journalist. And basically having those three in place, you'll have success over and over again. Well, and I'd like to speak to your point, your question about if you're interrupting people and if you're being rude or not polite. I, you know, I look at that from the social media standpoint, and I, that's why I'm such a huge proponent of LinkedIn. Um, if you, like, let's just say Susan is somebody that you wanted to be connected to. If you connected with Susan and said, I watched you on Get Seen, Be Heard with Karen and Christina yesterday, and I'd love to be connected to you here. When Susan goes over to LinkedIn, and I'm, I don't, I'm not speaking for Susan, just so you know. I'll just somebody else. <laughs> when they go over to LinkedIn, your mindset has shifted a little bit away from, you know, writing your story and to, okay, what's happening over here? So you're in that networking mindset a little bit when you're in your social media. So 
you know, right. you're not like, it's not like you're calling on the phone and you're interrupting them in the middle of the day. They're already in LinkedIn and they're in LinkedIn to see what's happening over there. So if you're just in the conversations there, I wouldn't be worried about being interrupted. I would absolutely make sure that you're developing a relationship and not just looking for what's in it for you. Right. But um, I think that you don't have to worry about interrupting if you use social media properly. I think now you're going to blow up Susan's LinkedIn inbox tomorrow and the <laughs> <laughs> Christmas card list. <laughs> yeah, Karen, I'm going to be sending them your way, saying, okay. <laughs> I told myself, I did it halfway through it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Oh, well, that's so great. Thank you very much for the advice, ladies. And uh, I'm really enjoying your blab this evening. So is this like a regular? You. you want a weekly slot? Every, or are you... Well, it's normally every Thursday at 2.30 Eastern yeah. today. Because of the holidays, we moved it to Wednesday. Next week will also be Wednesday. And then we go back to Thursdays in January. Perfect. All right, then. Well, thank you so much for your time. I'm so glad to see you, Grace. Have a great Christmas, everyone. I'm going to add it to my Thanks. Christmas book pile so my Amazon shopping list gets yes. longer and longer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Happy holidays to you. All right, I'm gonna. I am going to lock this seat now so we can wrap this up because we are already at an hour. I don't know how that happened. It's so fast. It goes so fast. So crazy. Susan, is there any last? How how can people find out more about you? Is your group that you mentioned out outrageous success? Is that open to people to, for people to join? They have to ask to join, but I, you know, unless you uh, <laughs> looks like some kind of weirdo and axe murderer, uh, I'd love for you to join. Um, I do have some rules. I don't want people to pitch their product or service there. This is about really helping each other. Um, and if, so if people do that, that, you know, it's one time, you know, I'm going to slap your hand the second time you're out of the group. So uh, it is a positive, forward thinking, helpful um, group because I, I started it just back when I saw so much bad stuff going on in the world and I said, you know what, let's focus on the good things and let's help each other. So yes, it's called Outrageous Success. And then also my website, Susan Solovic, but you know, you can follow me on Twitter, Susan at Susan Solovic. I'm on facebook.com backslash Susan Solovic and <clears throat> Karen on LinkedIn. <laughs> but <laughs> sorry. Yeah. But, and also the small biz expert Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, and if you go to my website and you sign up for my newsletter, you'll get a free ebook on smart marketing advice for small oh, business. Oh, perfect. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Check that out as well. Awesome. And then um, it looks like you're freezing, Karen. Sure. Next next week, again, we're on Wednesday. Steve Olsher, right? Steve next week. So, if you guys don't know Steve Olsher, you're in for a we're in for fun. No filter whatsoever. No. So, uh, um, but he, he's all about reinventing business and, uh, it's going to be a fun show. So make sure you're on, but Wednesday next week, not Thursday. Yes. Wednesday next week at two 30. Um, if you are watching us on YouTube, subscribe. If you're listening to us on iTunes, subscribe. Um, we love, you know, we love our guests so much and we are, we're so grateful and honored to be able to share these people with you guys. I hope this was helpful. I have a page full of notes and I never take notes. I do too. So, um, <laughs> I'm so flattered. Great. Thank you. Well, thanks. You guys have a great holiday. And thank you so much for inviting me to be oh, your guest. Thank you. For being here. All right. All right. Bye, okay. everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us today on our Blab series, Get Seen, Be Heard. If you've missed any episode, you can always find us at www.getseenbeheardtv.com backslash YouTube. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll always be notified when we upload a new episode. We work together with clients, helping them combine social media and PR to get more customers and grow their business. If that sounds like something you'd like to learn more about, visit us at www.soartoprofit.com. We have regular workshops where we combine our expertise and show you how to use social media and publicity to get seen and be heard. See you next week.